Welcome to Killer Women with your host, best-selling author, Danielle Girard. The Killer Women Vodcast is pleased to be a part of the Authors on the Air Global Radio Network. To learn more about Danielle and her books, visit her at www.daniellegirard.com and to access all of our vodcasts, go to youtube.com forward slash authors on the air. And now, Danielle's next killer woman. Hello, and welcome to the Killer Women podcast. I'm a proud member of the Authors on the Air global network with over 4 million listeners. I am your host, suspense author Danielle Girard, and my guest today is Hillary Fitzgerald Campbell. Hillary is first and foremost a law and order enthusiast and only second a comedian and New York New Yorker cartoonist. Murder Book is her graphic her debut graphic memoir. Stay tuned for her upcoming book The Joy of Snacking hitting the shelves in 2024. Welcome Hillary. It's going to be a while before that book comes out. <laughs> well, to go from murder to snacking. I I have some questions you about know what? that. I know I'm hitting all my bases, really. <laughs> exactly. I, I, I mean, it's so true. Okay, so tell our listeners about the murder book, which is murder hilarious. book. I know. Where does one begin? So, um, really, what I wanted to do was make a book that was about the true crime fandom, and that's the wrong word, probably, but it kind of is. Mm. Like it is, you know, the community that consumes it rather than murder itself. Um, Not to say, I mean, I do go through three different crimes specifically in the book, but I really wanted to break down why specifically women, but also, you know, humanity is so attracted to crime and what is it like intrinsically in our bodies that makes us not be able to turn away. Um, And so the book Of course, it follows like me on a personal level, asking myself those questions and hoping that they can answer the question for you as well uh, as a reader and listener. Um, And so I go through a lot of, um, you know, basically my relationship with my mother, which is where everything starts, you know. Totally. totally. (laughs) Um, I have questions about how your mother feels about this, but we'll get to that. Oh, she loves it. No. um, You do, you break the book into sort of um, a series of sections about sort of where this this obsession um, Mm -hmm. comes from. Mm -hmm. And and so I wanted it to be, you know, part personal, part historical, like reading of like the history of the true crime genre um, as well, you know, and then, and then with the, and then of course, then the actual murders I go through. But um, so sort of like asking yourself, how does one, what's the evolution of, of becoming obsessed with true crime? and um and all the different psychological things um that can draw you to it and and it's but it's mostly funny obviously i'm a i'm a funny lady <laughs> I, uh, I was, you are yeah, a funny lady yeah, i'm a funny lady and and the, the the reality is is so when i you know i've been at the new yorker for years and i've done lot some long form stuff but i i got when i got met my agent um michelle she was like okay I was like oh, I want to do my first big book you know what am, what am I going to do and she's like okay you know send me five ideas and one of my ideas was just like a line that just said well me and my mom are always talking about murder and then she was like I think you should follow that like yeah yeah <laughs> um and and honestly, I really was trying to find a way to just write about my mother because I'm obsessed with her. Um, That's so, so it was cute. like the book is really an avenue into getting into the relationship of me and my mom. Um, and you have older yeah. siblings, but there's a gap. Yes. There's a, yeah, yeah. I'm um, I'm a late baby, as they say. So they're all well now they're in their forties. Um, I'm so there's like my oldest sister's ten years older than me. And then this kind of goes down from there. And then there's a big gap before me. So I also have like the very much like almost growing up with like 10 sets of parents, you know, like there's just totally. And I was introduced to a lot of dark things. <laughs> right. Like because the old, right. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. And I think that, as you know, because we met because you, you know, my brother, which was so mm-hmm. bizarre. Um, mm-hmm. And he's also the straggler baby, right? I mean, he's yeah. the... He's actually, I mean, Tom is four years older, but we are, I'm 17 years older than Steve. And it felt like, 
your relationship with your siblings probably feels a lot like my relationship with Steve, right? We were yeah. always parenting him as well as, although not mm-hmm. doing a very good job. Like my husband took him <laughs> to see Pulp Fiction when he was like seven and For explains sure. a lot, right? Yeah, um, I know. Explains- my husband, well, that's what I put at the book of when I, um, I must've been like six when I was demanding someone take me to go see the First Wives Club. Like I was yes. like, this I think is the film for me. <laughs> Yes. Yes. So the opening scene, Stalker Channing kills herself because her marriage is going wrong. And I was like, I'm in for it. What a great film. Like <laughs> <laughs> I know. Not a yeah. feminist statement, but yeah, no. you know, I get no, it. No, but the rest of the movie is. Um but yeah, I mean I I I think you know, having yeah, like especially an older brother, like I was watching Cruel Intentions, you know, and like Friday and next Friday and like uh, I watch smoke signals all the time which is like a weird old 90s but like just a lot of um I saw some crazy shit as a little girl and, yeah um, yeah I think it, it all started percolating in my head that I <laughs> Um, but as, so how do you, how do you like, so, I mean, it is funny so, because you're a comedian as well. Right. And, yeah. and a cartoonist and really the, the, those things sort of ask for, for often for sort of a lightness. So you're somehow taking mm-hmm. this really dark stuff and twisting mm-hmm. it into humor. Which that's what I like though. I think that like um, humor allows you to talk about something that's uncomfortable and I think that's you know often the point of humor is to poke fun at our everyday realities and stuff and whether they're super dark or just little dark you know <laughs> um, and sort of you know humor makes fun of it in order to question it in order to get you to think about it um, and I think specifically with cartoons I think that's why in the book I'm able kind of to like walk the very fine line of laughing at murder, you know, like, right. cause you can talk about something serious, but then since it's a silly drawing, it makes it a sort of acceptable that I'm like being pretty gruesome, you know? Right. Um, but I think that the, the humor is kind of what, you know, makes it accessible. Right. Right. Mm-hmm. And it's, and it's so personal. This is the other thing that I find yeah. so interesting is that, you know, it is real. There's a lot of uh, yourself in this book. Sure. And I mean, it is a mem- mem- memoir, memoir, you know. <laughs> yes, it's a memoir. Um, yeah. And I, fu- I thought that was so it's again, you can you really comfortable at making fun of yourself, right? That's sort of part mm-hmm. of it, like the mm-hmm. obsession, the young obsession, your mm-hmm. own sort of, you know, relationships and all of you know and the idea that you're like you you are self-proclaimed anxious person and is it an anxious person who thinks about murder and then I was like maybe that's why I'm also attracted to murder it's an anxiety that makes us sort of like go to the darkest place yeah I think that absolutely um anxiety and anxiety related things um are a huge part of being drawn into because it is it's like well, what's the worst that could happen all the time, you know? Right. And so the worst that could happen is that somebody kills you. <laughs> right. You know, so like, you're like, that's, you get, that's, that's for sure the worst. Like, you die a gruesome, horrible death. For yeah. Sure. Yeah. And then I think, um, and, you know, go on in the book about, and I, you know, I read a lot of whatever studies by psychologists who wrote about this in order for to help me write the book um, about how when you, watch true crime especially for women of course because um even though statistically more men are killed every year but what we see on tv and read and listen to and everything is with women dying at the hands of men um so when you see that it's like your brain is just sort of studying all the red flags to for your life like okay, right. well, i'll never date that kind of guy or if and i I'll, see that right. he's doing this and Obviously, if he takes an insurance policy out on me, big red flag, <laughs> you know. Right, um, right. But your gap, like anxiety, is sort of, you like sort of gathering all the tips and tricks to hold in your back pocket in order to keep yourself from being murdered. Right. Which is, it I mean, work, which is what I, I know, right? I mean, I don't know. I mean, I know that I do it just even walking down the street in New York. I'm always just like, well, if, <laughs> if yeah. right now someone, I did it yesterday because. Sometimes I, you know, you try to get away from your phone. So I'll be like, I'll take a walk without my phone, you know, yeah. but then I go, okay, but now I don't have my phone. Right. <laughs> I go, right. So if somebody so if I was attacked me. right now, right. Like, 
what would I do right I'm like going through all of it just as I'm going to the dog park you know and I'm like this right. is why am I thinking about this like <laughs> well that's and I do it at night particularly at night yeah. like when I'm if I'm sleeping alone you know my mm -hmm. husband's traveling I'm like okay yeah. so what's the shortest distance could I get out the window where would yeah. I run would I, I break know. my ankle when I dropped from the second floor? You know, yeah. and if I broke yeah. my ankle, could I still run? <laughs> could I still get there? Could I go yeah. full like Ted Bundy into the mountains, like with a, you know, <laughs> I know. So these things, you know, I think um, certainly there, I would assume there is a higher anxiety of it because of the saturation of true crime um, on all our streaming platforms. Um, but that being said, like, you know, whatever crimes existed since the dawn of time. So, um, yeah, but, but I, yeah, it's something, you know, I was just, um, you think about it and you worry about it and it's, um, it's a, yeah. And then you write about it and then, and of course it can be a vicious cycle. Like you're like, if, you, if I watch more true crime, then I'm more anxious that something's going to happen to me, but then I want to watch more, you know, and it yeah. can kind of go on forever. I yeah. definitely have times throughout the year where I step away from how yeah. much, like, like, I'm like, okay, I need to like go read a silly book or like, I need yes. to read something so different or yeah. I'll get really into podcasts. And then I'm like, I'm super obsessed with this one right now called Murder and Alliance. And I'm like binging it so much. And I was like, I know after this, I'm going to be like, I need something so different. Um, right. I think I yeah. feel that just from reading a lot of dark fiction too. And, yeah. and if you're living in it, like, you know, when you were writing this book, I imagine it's even more on your mind, right? It's yeah. a really, it's to, to, to dig into this darkness is, and mm -hmm. is when you write these kinds of books, right? You live with mm -hmm. it day in, day I out. Know. Cause the, I know. the book, and that's a different experience, right? It's so different. I was like, I remember having a moment where I went to my boyfriend. I was like, I never want to have to draw Ted Bundy's face again. Like, oh. I'm so sick of this. What am I, what, why did I choose to do this? You know, and I still probably had like 20, I was like, I have 20 more pages of his freaking face. Yeah. There's a lot again. of Bundy. I know. Yeah. You really, that's one of the crimes you go into, which is, yeah. um, but I, I love, definitely, yeah. Yeah. No, say so you definitely. Oh, I don't know what, I don't know what I was going to say. Um, but yeah, I, I think, I mean, well, I actually listened to a lot of Taylor Swift while I was writing in order to like, I was like, to like right. have, like I'm in this headspace, but I'm going to have something completely else that I'm different than I'm listening to. That's to right. That's a fairly different tone. Well, I balance, there's some, balance there's, me out. I, I tagged, I, as I have known yes. to do, I tagged yeah. all these um, places that made me laugh. But one of them, I, I, the other thing that I think is so interesting is like you talk about the way that in, we treat women victims, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, there'll be like in the in the Bundy cases um, or what, who was the couples? No, it wasn't Bundy. It was- um, oh, Zodiac. Yeah, Zodiac. the Zodiac. And it would be like, you know, this guy is like, he was the, you know, football player and the this and the that and this pretty yeah. girlfriend. Right. It was I know. never nothing of substance yeah. about her. Right. I know. I and, and my research to try to find more information on the women you found. So I was like, we know that this guy's an Eagle Scout and we know everything about him. And then we can't figure out like it's like she had a nice fur coat on that night. I'm like, but who was she? Like, right. what? Like, why do we not know? Um I think the most of people you knew about was Cecilia. She had a little more information, but, but no, I know. And I mean, obviously times have changed, but when you look back at older, older victims, um, back in the day and they, they, uh, oh man, the way women are described. Um, that's why I like Anne Rule's writing so much. It's like, she goes so deep into like the lives of all, of, all of the different female victims that she writes about and you like really understand who they are um and what a loss um yeah is yeah. coming from that but um right because we should celebrate I mean we have to celebrate these people who were mm -hmm. their lives right I mean yeah and it's interesting too it like the way that I, and it still happens today the way that women are lured into places because we are taught you have to be nice and polite yeah. and you know like um carry you know, you should really carry, um, you know, Ted Bundy's books for him if he's yes. hurt or whatever right. it was, right. right? I know. I think about that of myself on a daily, I can't help but be so nice. Like when I'm like, you know, just strangers or whatever. I'm like, 
I will find myself in weird, uncomfortable situations still just because I think I need to be polite. Yeah. We're taught to be polite, right? To not, yeah. And and authority and and oftentimes, I mean, police are sometimes, you know, authority figures are are sometimes the bad guys. So it's, I know it's hard to know, like it's teaching my, you know, your daughters or, you know, to be like, Mm -hmm. um, suspect everyone isn't really I know it's not a I know you're like you don't want to like tell them people are bad but I think that like the like the thing is is like all to like learn to just trust your gut like as soon as you think something's not right especially that's Caroline right the um I can't remember it's a victim the Ted Bundy victim who like knew something was wrong yes but felt like because he said he was a security guard like she just thought, was like oh okay I'll still go but like she knew you know right. um and I think more of like learning to trust your gut instinct on a feeling around somebody like Georgia Hardstark tells that great story I can't remember if she just told it on my favorite murder or if it's in stay sexy <laughs> and don't get murdered you know it's I don't know if it's right. in the book or um, but the story of like the, she, this guy was taking pictures of her as like, and like was very interested in her. And she's a young girl and like photographer. And he finally lures her out into like the Hollywood Hills to like do some photography. And she like, she was so mad at herself for having gotten to that point of like knowing something's wrong. But then I think she like finally says like, trust your gut. And she ran away from him that like whatever evening it was and like maybe saved her own life yeah Um, and I'm sure I just botched that story completely but know that Georgia has like a really good story about learning to trust your gut and I feel like Mm. that's something they they talk about a lot um and yeah yeah it's and then the and then there's this thing you do I love this this sort of misogyny Mm -hmm. of this whole right it's like um the boys will be boys and why mm-hmm. would she by herself and then this I know maybe don't dress like that I mean this I whole hate, thing is yeah. so spot on and so mm-hmm. and of course we still do that today you know we still I look know. at the victim and be, why was she wearing that tight skirt I mean I know she probably was she asking for it um I mean it's so of horrible course, I think I you know I hate that old saying um you still see it in a lot of like you know like cop shows they're like well why would a woman be alone in a bar and I'm like I'm alone in a bar all the time right like I'm just like that's where I like to work yes (laughs) I know that came that was hilarious too I'm like Um, that's where I like to work like I'm not alone in a bar begging for you know right and being alone in a bar doesn't yeah it doesn't mean you want to go home with someone I know it's not an open invitation but it's such a that's such an old school police phrase or you know like well she was there you know you know like that's only one reason a woman's alone in a bar at night you're like no there's so many reasons man there's there's so many reasons because they're women are just people too the same reason a man could be alone in a bar right Um, right but it's been that yeah I mean there's um again I feel like not that like everything's been eradicated but I feel like there is you know some progress today but when you just look at like the gendered language that surrounds um um the you know criminal justice system as far as like um you know d- the, the word panties is always like you know, I, 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 I go I why are that. we still saying panties like you just you say call underwear it, I was gonna say do you like, call your underwear panties because I don't know I'm like I better go get it. some underwear to pack for this trip I never say yeah. that word that like, is so bizarre. It, Who uses that word besides men? I know. They're like, well, some female panties. And you're like, what, they make, that sounds so infantile. Like, it sounds like I'm a little, I'm a little kid and I need to put my panties on or something. Or I don't get it, it. It sounds sex, like you're like, the no, it sounds sexual. Are, and yes. Some weird, like juvenile as well. I don't know. It's, it's, that it really bothers me. When me too. Um, I read about it's in so many them. law and order episodes where they're like, you know, if it was a man's underwear on the ground, they wouldn't be saying that. But whatever, you know, there's, panties, well, there's some panties right. in the corner. And you're like, what is that? There are, uh, there are so many laugh out loud moments in this, which is a, a, yeah. a thing. I, I mean, obviously you're very funny, um, <laughs> but I love, like, this is like, this is the, it's all about anxiety, which I, <laughs> yeah. I was like dead on. I love this. 
uh, uh, your mother is a casually nervous, you are a casually yeah. nervous lady. So many fun yeah. things. So talk yeah. to me. So you decided, I mean, you've been, so how long have you been a cartoonist? Um, I, I yeah. With the New York well, way. I know. The, yeah. So it's funny. I mean, I started drawing cartoons when I was five. Yeah, um, exactly. But no, I, so I actually, I had a different career before I took a hard pivot. Um, I used to work in film and I, all this other stuff. And um, in 2014 or 2015, um, something like that. Yeah. I ran away to New York and like was like I'm gonna become a cartoonist. Um, which well, is a, it worked. Is a, I know. Funny thing. I mean, to I'm say, sure you know? it wasn't quite that smooth, yeah. but um, yeah, you did no, it. And I, I mean, was... I had a lot of other jobs too. But um, I think I submitted for a year before I sold anything, and I believe 2016 mm -hmm. um, is something like 2016 is when I finally broke through which is like only the beginning of trying you know you, you I know. finally sell you sell one thing you oh my god I sold one thing like you're yeah. like it's still gonna be a hard journey from there on but um yeah. I sold that and then my other my kind of other big break as far as letting me step away from like being a nanny I find like just getting enough money um was I illustrated this great book called Feminist Fight Club uh, it was uh written it's by New York Times journalist Jessica Bennett. It's a super awesome like manifesto of um, like, you know fighting sexism in the workplace and a lot of like women helping women. Um, anyway, that I when I illustrated that book, um, that like just sort of that and the New Yorker at the same time is what really sort of was the beginning of my career. And then seeing that that book was that was that when you were like, okay, I want to do this. I want to do the book thing myself because that's a yeah. very different kind of process than writing even a long format cartoon mm -hmm. is what like you know yeah I mean yeah I've done like I, I you know it, it started it started small like I you know I started doing just what they're, they're called gags gag cartoons with single panels um and then I got feminist fight club which was just like fun illustration work for me um and then after that I started to get more jobs to illustrate other people's books uh -huh. um and I did um, a book called Real Talk About Mental Health, which I really loved working on because I do do a lot of mental health work um, and or I write a lot, a lot of mental health stuff. Um, and that, and then after that, I've, I've done a bunch of books now. I'm like, oh my God, what books have I done? That's okay. Are You My yeah. Uber? Um, I saw anyways, that one too. Yeah. It looks yeah. like it's like the cover of Are You My Mother? From yeah, yeah, that was fun. Way. I had to like mimic somebody else's art, you know, um, yeah. but Anyways, and then at the same time, while I was like, you know, um, starting to do like, I'm still, you know, still doing New Yorker stuff, like illustrating pe for other people. But then I really started to just start read more female graphic memoirs and yeah. graphic novels. And I was getting so into them. And I just really love um, the introspective work. Um, and, you know, I do love autobio. I love reading, I love reading memoirs. So I'm mm -hmm. like, I just love facts about people's lives. I'm like, I'll tell me facts all day long. It's just like, it's riveting to me. Um, so I began to read more of those and like the work of like Julia Wirtz and Ross Chast and, uh, you know, Gabrielle, um, oh God, I'm forgetting Gabrielle's last name. Anyways, um, so I was, and then I started to do more long form personal comics and selling them to, you know, a bunch of different publications. And so it's like, I started to do more like, okay, like a 10 page and then I'll do like a 20 page piece. Um, I was doing more and more. And then that, with that led to me wanting to really sort of tackle, a, you know, and this was like, obviously 350 pages. Yes. So, yeah, I mean, this is right. This is huge. Um, yeah. So what was the, you know, what was the process like? I mean, did you did you imagine it in the sections or did you just yeah um, what did, did I you outline so, a little bit so you kind of yeah. knew where you were going I kind of you know I'm not a big like hardcore outliner like I have like my general ideas um because when I sold the book I had drawn 70 pages um that's kind of like here's my big sample packet because especially like selling your first book I was like yeah. you want to really like let the publisher know this is how I write yeah. Um, and you can do it that you yeah. can do a big uh, you yeah know. yeah yeah so I, I basically I had drawn the zodiac chapter at that point mm -hmm. um when I didn't know at first I thought it was always going to be the beginning but then it, you know it started to move around but I was kind of trying 
to map out, like I was like, okay, I know the three cases I want to do. I want to do Zodiac, Bundy, and this Anne Rule book um, that I just loved. And then, um, and then I was, the thing that I couldn't figure out how to do for a while and I kept moving around was um, the, the like murder class part where mm -hmm. I'm like yeah. just teaching the history of murder. So I was like, uh, my editor and I were working together of like how to try to weave the historical part in with the pop culture, with personal. And that, so that definitely took a while. Like I was just moving pages around a lot um, right. and seeing right. like how I could get the flow in. And then, and then it was almost like when I got to the end of the book, I realized I needed to change the beginning. Um, mm -hmm. so yeah, I, that I add, yeah, which is obviously that's like so common. Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah. and I love the fact that like, so it's so interesting because it's when you do a graphic novel, you have to set us somewhere all the time. So there's like mm -hmm. the whole scene at the bar where she's like, mm -hmm. just talk or you, or I guess, mm -hmm. or just talking yeah. to like the bartender and a random person at the bar. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a way of her being able, you being able to communicate just, sort of your interest is real. Yeah. I thought that was clever. Yeah. So I yeah, was like, I had fun. So I'm deciding, I was like, okay, so first I'm going to be at a bar talking, then I'm going to be at a diner talking, and then right. I'm going to be on an airplane talking. That was and hilarious too. Yeah. I, and you know, I really did meet a little girl that I talked, like, we obviously didn't have that, I, that conversation, but yeah. I did meet this little girl on a flight and I sat next to her and I'm watching like me in like such a whatever wild emotional state I was in that day. I was like, I could only handle Disney films. Like I was like, what I don't know what I was upset about, but I'm like watching like like The Lion King or something. And I turn over and she is watching um oh gosh, what's that horror? She's watching a horror film. And I was like, <laughs> and I was like, she was clearly like eight. And I was like, oh man, do I want to talk to her? Like, yeah, <laughs> right. And we did talk and she did at the end, she went, will you follow me on Instagram? And we talked all, of, oh, we, she was watching A Quiet Place. And I was like, oh, and she's like, I've seen it three times. And I was like, okay, oh my you're God. me. Like, yes. I was like, I felt like I met my former self. Uh, so I knew I wanted to use her because I had written, I had like drawn her just in my sketchbook that day. because I was like, she's awesome um that's so funny and, and her but, dad you know, was beside you, her in the play yes yeah he was there and he was like I hope she's not bothering you and I was like not at all like <laughs> right, not right. in the I'm so curious yeah. I'm so curious yeah. to, right to yeah. interview her he was so sweet um and so I knew I wanted to do that because you know you're trying to especially with, with cartooning and and like trying to figure out how what's the device that you're going to use in order to talk to the reader yeah. um so without I mean they can also you know with obviously you just, you just talk to them with no reason but I'd like to give some setup and it's it, it's really it was sort of just helps me figure out the drawing of it all because I do work in those like I do work in diners I do work in bars so it's just yeah. sort of a more natural place for me to set it um but it, it so it took me three years I think basically to draw it um in total and it's like I'm starting or I'm like six months in on my new book and I'm like oh my god I have so much longer to go yeah so well, especially painful. if you're yeah. I mean you're, you're you're not doing it full time and it seems to me yeah that it takes a lot I mean so like how long does it take you to I mean some of these are really intricate drawings you know what I, I mean? know like this yeah. guy over here yeah I know it's like you have pages that are like easy but then you have pages like where you need to draw you know and then you're doing research mm. of like what did it look like in Vallejo mm. California in 1956 right you know, and I'm like trying to doing a lot of random google searches which I'm yeah now again right like I've been trying to look for a potato chip factory in a small town in Nebraska that's what I've been trying to, from like 1955 like that's what I'm working on it's right now um, trying to find it that's hilarious yeah, yeah and I'm finding some random like Facebook posts where like they do have a picture of it um but um so uh, yeah I, the thing is like you can I guess if you wanted to you could write faster you know but you can't draw faster like if yeah. you're like trying to meet a deadline you're like you literally <laughs> you just can't do it like it's it, it, it can only go at the pace that it can go at um so I can do I can do probably five pages a day if I'm like really trying to kill myself. Right. Um, that's a lot. You know, yeah. And it's a lot of just because it just hurts my hand. And that's right. just drawing it. Cause then I you draw it and everything. And then so I draw by hand on paper, but then I do um 
the you know filling in the gray tones the gray scale that I do on an iPad um okay just like um you know using so you brush. scan it and then yeah you scan all the work then you have to clean oh my god it just takes forever so you scan it and you bring it into Photoshop and then you see a little hair here and a little piece of an eraser mark there and then you have to go clean that up <laughs> yeah and then you bring it in I use procreate so then I bring it into on my iPad for the procreate app and then I go in and do um, yeah all the great uh, the, it's called tones um yeah yeah and so I can see them like in this that, you know, yeah like her, the, yeah down here that's I get really exactly that one takes then that takes another century <laughs> well um it's interesting so then and then the and then I was wondering like I was thinking like what happens when you want to change if you had to change the words mm-hmm. but that's mm-hmm. all done do you do that are these so are I edit writing? digitally yeah no so I um like I that that's all hand drawn you know it's all like your handwriting do, yeah I'm handwriting okay. everything but and no, but if, when I have to make an edit, I do it digitally. I go, you know, I'm like, I don't, I'm not that much of a purist that like, every yeah, single, it's like, a redraw, especially, yeah. especially if you realize like, I mean, I've uh, absolutely, there's some pages where I, go, I just have to redraw the whole page. Like I'm screwed. Um, you know, yeah. your editor comes in and is like, well, we need to cut this and have it, you know, go over to here and bring these two things together. Um, but yeah. you know, if I need to just get rid of one panel, I'll just erase it digitally. Cause you know, you can, you can only have so much time on your hands. Right. Um, but it's a long process. <laughs> yeah. It sounds like it. Well, there's, I was reading in the, um, New York times, cause you talk about the, the, how much time, um, it takes to draw. And it was saying mm-hmm. that, um, one, like they were saying something about how one of the few ways that people can still lose themselves is to draw. Did you read that mm. article? It no. Was so fascinating. And um, it was, yeah, because it's like, you know, you, even if for somebody who has zero art, artistic talent, the, the, the process of drawing something, like you said, it can't really be sped up. Mm-hmm. And it, it, it allows people to step back because we're so used to everything is instant on our phones and on sure. our screens and uh, in sure. life, yeah. but the drawing is so, and they were saying it's really good for us. And I was wondering like, you know, do you feel that because it's your job? So that yeah. changes well, it no, a little but bit. I, it is, um, it, when, you know, if you're feeling, if you're in the right mood, especially when I go in and I like doing like if I'm painting it in or whatever it it can be some of the most zen stuff where you're just sort of like you're just getting the flow of it and you're just like not thinking like you're thinking but you're not thinking you know Um, and I love I do love drawing (laughs) yeah I have to I hope you do yeah I know right the no, no shit Hillary um but, and I love, cause then when I get like, you know, when I'm not in my writing phase, when I like really just, I already know what I'm going to draw and everything. I, you know, blast all sorts of ABBA and like, sort of just like, whatever it is you want to listen to. I really, um, I like loud music. Um, but that's a good, I want to read that article. Cause it is true. I mean, that's a big, you know, as kids, um, I remember my art teacher is always telling me like, you can doodle in class. Like that's what makes you listen more. And you're like, it yeah. is true. Yeah. It's, I thought, I thought it was really interesting and I have zero, zero <laughs> like artistic ability that way, but I never, I can understand how that feels. And I did think about, I thought about you and also, you know, my brother, since he's, I was so going to say Steve. Yeah. I mean, he does those crazy intricate drawings where I'm crazy. sure he so lost in them. I think he does. And I think that's kind yeah. of an amazing thing. Um, mm-hmm. So it's so funny. Okay. So the other thing I was thinking about is this sort of stand up comedic, you know, comedy, which I'm sorry, but that I've watched Steve do that. That's one of the most terrifying things I've ever seen <laughs> in my entire life. I mean, it's what I sure. love stand up comedy, but when you know yeah. the comedian and you know they're like a pretty much a novice, I just felt like yeah. it was just to talk about anxiety. So it's, it's, so it's funny to me that 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 that's like something that you that you've chosen to do as an anxious person can you talk about that that's I know what is I know why it's yes you know um but I would say so many comedians are you know they're like "Ah." but then suddenly on stage you feel comfortable it's weird I mean not truly all the time you know like I'm nervous but like I'm there's a weird when you have the micro like you're more in control because you have the microphone um but 
oh, it's got to be something to do with narcissism. My God, like, <laughs> I, like that you're like I love talking. Like even if I am like a hot mess, I love being silly, and I just and I love I love to be on stage. I haven't been on stage in a while, and I really miss it. Um, I know Steve just had a show, um, but. I, oh God, I don't have anything intelligent to say about this. It's funny. It's a funny, weird thing to be drawn to. Yes. Um, it's, it's, cause it's like a, it's just, it's, it is like, I do like performing, um, you know, and it's, 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 it's really fun to be able to like, cause I know cartooning, super isolating. Well, that's very, what I was going to say. Like, right. It's so different. Yeah. Yeah. And then, so like being out and like comedy and meeting people and like, you know the community of it and laughter and um a fun audience and stuff um but also terrifying absolutely I mean I think probably the reason I haven't done comedy in a while is just because like especially it's like going into like you used to do it all the time and then then 2020 happened the and, pandemic, I think me, yeah. and then obviously I think I know a lot of comedians felt like this coming out of it of like taking a year plus obviously off of it and then being like, God, I guess I don't need to go torture myself every night. Right, right. Like that was, I, I mean, that's so, what it feels like. Yeah. Yeah. But so I did wonder it, because the two artists that I know now, yeah. you and my brother, are yeah. both stand-up comedians. And I was trying to, and not just art, but drawing. That's like really right. what right. both of you guys um yeah. do yeah. Di- differently. And I was trying to figure out if there's some sort of crossover between being I you know, know drawing and common stand up com- comedy but i do think to your point the isolation of your uh of the process of uh, being mm-hmm. a cartoonist and mm-hmm. an artist and a writer for that matter right mm-hmm. but um but i don't know a lot of writers that do stand up comedy to yeah, be honest I, i'm sure i mean not my kind of writers anyway not your kind of writers mm-hmm. in hollywood you'd you'd know a lot of them um, yes i think what i know for me what i really like about doing it is like it because I write, you know, when you're writing jokes on paper, it's so different than figuring out how a joke's going to work on stage Yeah, um, with delivery. And so I know that when I, you know, when I was doing more comedy, I felt like I was really getting closer into what my voice is. Because it's like, I'm doing this stuff that's like, the, what I'm learning on stage is informing how you know my cartoons at the New Yorker and my cartoons at the New Yorker I'm figuring out like okay well that set up how would I do that on stage like it's the same thing but how do I um how would I approach it on a verbal you know in a different delivery um so I like it it keeps my brain fresh I guess yeah yeah coming up with new stuff yeah and I was we I I want to go back to anxiety for a minute because I thought that was interesting Mm -hmm. and I wondered if we think, you know, it's like, so as an anxious human, as anxious humans, mm-hmm. um, do I think your mom and I would get along really well too, by the way, I'm I would sure like, sure that you would, I would like, to be <laughs> I also come hang like, out, I come to also, Sonoma. Okay. Uh, I mean, it's I, a great place to visit. <laughs> exactly. I'm out there sometimes. I'd love that. So yeah. I wonder, do you think, um, and that was what was sort of the chicken and the egg question, right? Mm-hmm. Does the, does mm-hmm. the anxiety feed the interesting true crime or does the true crime feed the anxiety? I know. Or is it like that, a loop? I think it is a loop. It's totally a loop. Um, obviously, it has to start somewhere, but um, it's it is a loop. I mean, it does take a person to be drawn to true crime, though. You know, like because not everybody who's anxious wants to like. And then whenever I meet women that are like, I don't really do that. I go, what? Like. like <laughs> <laughs> my boyfriend's mother does not partake in the true crime world and I'm still hmm. baffled by it I'm always like what uh, so you so you just didn't you didn't watch that like <laughs> you are right. like I have to watch that immediately or I need to read that book or, and she's like no and I'm like oh my god what um and <laughs> um I think that's why I was hoping for the book also to be like an explanation to people who don't get it like mm-hmm. um the book can also be read by somebody who's like why are people so into this and then this book will be like this is why you know mm-hmm. um but it, it it is I think that you know it also requires a very dark sensibility um to want to consume um this kind of stuff but but also, I mean, the other part of the book is like talking about how like your brain enjoys a puzzle, you know, it's right. like there's, 
so much about it um, in reading, I mean, in reading mystery too, obviously, and thrillers and stuff is like, that it's like an exercise for your brain of how, like, what, what are these clues? How can, like, I want to figure it out. Mm -hmm. um, and I love that old couple that figured out the Zodiac, um, the first, one of the first Zodiac code key things. Right, they were just, like that yeah. old couple that just like took it as like a puzzle to undo and they did it. Yeah. It's um, interesting because so this this now that we have that that everything is you know televised and reported, yeah. there is this sense of people getting involved in helping solve absolutely. Crimes, which of course. I, I mean like I'm I'm definitely a member of Web Sleuths. Um <laughs> like that there's so many online communities that I mean what was the case last summer of the the people on TikTok of that poor young girl who got murdered by her boyfriend in the woods? Oh wow, right. I'm really the people on tic know. TikTok figured it out before the police did. Right. And so there's this wild sort of new world. I sound like I'm like 80. There's this new world on the internet, but um, but there is like kind of like the, I mean, especially on Reddit, there's huge Reddit threads of people, you know, helping solve crimes. Um, and then there, I mean there's web sleuths, there's all these different like pages of like that, that actually it can be, you know, incredibly helpful, you know, like yeah. that like this is like a very positive thing um like and there's that documentary don't fuck with cats um so it was like the um that like that it was a group of internet people that solved that guy serial killer um and just by people sort of being a little obsessive and then being yeah. like okay here's this puzzle let me let me break down this puzzle and actually right. like not that law enforcement knows probably how to like utilize that it's not like they well, can that like be like hey tiktokers and they like just completely you know outside of the legal system i don't know that's obviously a big issue for them too you know right. like that like right. that other people are like in like impeding on investigations um right. so that's that's a whole complicated thing um but it, it it does open this avenue of it's i mean i think the best part of it actually though is with cold cases where yeah, like all, right, right. so many old cases can now get solved Right, because someone out there can take an interest in it. Right, and, and the really, DNA, yeah. like the the twenty three and Me, and the DNA that yes. now it's like yeah. if you were if you're the second cousin of a serial killer and you put yeah. your DNA in there, then their DNA yeah. shows up. I mean, I yeah. do actually, I do think you know, it, one of the things that the book points out rightly is that so many of these ser serial killers were like so close to being nabbed when they sort of you know, is, I mean, escape, just escape, or just yeah. right. And, and so sort of it, can I mean, I mean that's something you virtually almost can't do anymore. I mean, certainly right. people can, you know, try to hide, but the the way the world is now is obviously everything's trackable, everything's mm -hmm. traceable, every tiny little thing that you do is <laughs> monitored, which is creepy obviously yeah um, unless you're a but, serial killer and then we want to be monitored, yeah right? i know i know i know um but you know that's it it changes it's obviously really changes the game for police and and i guess yeah. for, for, for so it's for interesting because yeah. there was this heyday of serial killers right i mean right were, you know yeah. working in the you know late 70s 80s and right. i wonder if that's part of the reason that they're you know that they there aren't as many it's not that they're not right. as many but they get caught before they really get i think you know i mean like i obviously don't know like the statistics on that but it would seem to me that um you know i know there are active serial killers still amongst us but um but i think that there just isn't kind of the chance to be someone as psychotic um as a bundy or yeah whatever, and get a Right. You know, just, I mean, just phones in general, just phones, right. just like all these right. things um, that it not hiding his identity, that, just driving around yeah. in the same car. I know. I know. So, yeah. It just wouldn't happen. Um, and, you know, I mean, people don't hitchhike really anymore. You know, there's so much that was going on in the 70s and 80s that, um, you know, so many more people were at risk. Um, yeah. And, I, you know, I kind of made that joke in the book of like one of, Bundy's victim victims was missing for 17 days before her, right. even her roommates even said anything and I was like my mother you know and so yes. many others like <laughs> if I was if I don't respond in two hours I'm in right. trouble 
Right. You know, like, right. where are you? One time, one time I was in a movie theater and I came out and I had like 20 missed calls. And then I had texts from all my siblings and I had an email from my father saying, your mother's worried. Where are you? And then, and, and then text email. from my sister. Yeah. And then like a follow-up email, phone call, text messages, voicemails. And then my sister being like, mom called me and she needs to know where you are. And I'm like, I was at the movies. Like, <laughs> I, Hillary, I'm I'd like so to tell you sorry. that I'm, I'm not one of those mothers, but I totally am. I'm like, <laughs> I want to be able to track my children yeah, yeah, in and out yeah. of movies. And <laughs> yeah, I know. So, so but yeah, point like, they're going to cut me off, but I'm until yeah. then, I'm, I can just see where That's they are. That's fine. You know what? I would not even get mad. It made me laugh. I went, you guys, yeah. I mean, thank you. You know, like, right. Thank you right. for caring. That, <laughs> they love you. You would not be yeah. able to go oh, beyond for 17 days before no. somebody had tracked no. you down not a chance I, I love um, it well it's I mean there's so many wonderful things and I I do love how much of your you know your personality and um your own sort of you know feminist insights it's mm-hmm. really it's so fun uh, I think it's a book everyone would love it I am it's like kind of I mean I've read like the Sandman right yeah but I yeah. haven't read I don't know whether it's just my generation didn't read that much I don't think there used to be so many obviously graphic novels or memoirs you know it's um there's so much of it now and it's some of my I think some of the most amazing um especially I think women in the graphic novel uh, Mm -hmm. world are like it seems uh, for me I feel like women just are really excelling in it and um it's such an intuitive way to tell a story I just love it and yeah yeah, I could recommend a million books to you well, you did it. You've recommended a few, which is so fun, but yeah. we'll start with the one that you, um, we'll start with this one, the murder yeah, book. Yeah, which is yeah mine. Start, yeah. Start with, <laughs> and, um, and, you know, I love that your middle name is Fitzgerald because I guess you're yeah. a little related to F. Scott. I'm just a little related. Yeah. His little sister is my great grandmother. I would be um, so curious. What do you think he would think of um, the murder book? I know. Book? God. Would he, he would have totally blurbed it, I'm sure. <laughs> He'd be like... <laughs> I, should have, I should have put a fake blurb. Brilliant. Yeah, exactly. You could do said. that. Yeah, yeah. I love it. Um, okay, so tell us a little bit about what's next. I, um, right, so book. I know. So I just, you know, I, I think um, coming out of that book, I was like, oh my God, I want to do something completely different. Um, and I had drawn kind of like a 20 ish page comic that was on a publication called electric literature that was called, I'm not a foodie, but I'm not a bad person. Um, (laughs) and like when I had drawn it, I was like, oh, I already can feel like I could do this as a whole book. Like I'd drawn this kind of like, almost like a summary of it, you know, um, about like growing up um, as a really hardcore picky eater, because I, I was just legitimately afraid of food for the first many, many years of my life. Um, and, and, and there's, everything is such foodie culture now that I was like, I want to, I want to make a book that's like, eat Cheez-Its, you know, like, like, and, I noticed um, they were, yeah, they had yeah. cheesies on the plane. That was so I funny. know, I, I, li- I just bought Cheez-Its right before I was at the grocery store buying Cheez-Its, but, I was like, I want to make a cookbook that's like not really a cookbook, you know, that's just like, it's okay if you want to have a hot dog, you know, like, yes, right. um, and, but then, you know, but also it's, you know, it's also, you know, so it's drawn, it's not, it's not written. Um, and, um, but really wanting to explore um, kind of in a similar way of murder book, like through my own personal relationship and battles with food, especially as a woman, you know, throughout you know your teens your 20s um right. and like how your relationship with food affects your relationship with your family and then how food can like between you and your a romantic partner and how like the um the different ways in which like one's relationship to food and how you know the different ways it connects you to all types of relationships um and so um it's been really fun and and also it's because i yeah i it's because i have been you know in love with dating a man who's a, a big foodie and cook and it was a real difficult part when we met I was like I like you but like I don't want your food and it, it's <laughs> like and then for him it was devastating he's like what like and I'm like I know I'm weird like I like snacks like, like <laughs> um so I don't like meals of, I like snacks it, yeah like I just eat like 
you know, like 30 snacks throughout the day. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. But so wanting to just write about the, the journey of truly really just learning to love yourself, of course. Um, <laughs> but I've been having so much fun just drawing about like me as a six year old, um, you know, only eating egos and like getting in fights with my you know, parents about it. Like, I'm not going to eat what you want me to eat. And, but now, cause I'm, it's, I'm, I'm seeing my, my uh, niece go through the same thing. Like my sister, Courtney, um, her daughter, Lily, I mean, she's eight now, but when she, I mean, she still has a lot of, she's super anxious when people tell her to eat something. And like mm -hmm. Courtney has always been like, I just need my daughter to eat. Like, I'm so worried about it. Like, how do I get her to eat? And I was like, I identify, like, I feel like she's my mm -hmm. daughter. And yeah. I told her, I was like, this is what you need to do. Like, you can't pressure her right you cannot make it a big deal and like we like we have like together figured out ways in order to like approach her about food that doesn't make her upset and yeah. it's um I think that obviously a lot of parents wonder about it and then I was like oh my god I can write about this of like this is what you should do like give them the <laughs> so now she gives this little eight-year-old I'm like you make her a charcuterie plate basically you know yeah like give her a little bits of cheese and some crackers and then you don't tell her what to do and then right. like food is okay and it's not oh mm -hmm. anyways she's obviously just as anxious as I am god bless her <laughs> well I think and I it's true I think there is something to that because also we're I mean particularly as young women we're told yeah. not to eat don't yeah. eat but eat yeah but you yeah. know but don't eat um mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and yeah it's a really kind of a screwed up we don't eat just for sustenance which is why we, what we sh what right. we should be doing it becomes right. a very emotional mm -hmm. and then it's a celebration mm -hmm. and it's a mm -hmm. ritual and it's got a i'm actually kind of i think i'm i'm like you as well i'm not my husband's also a really good cook and mm -hmm. i'm also not really interested in food but i am like yeah. is dinner ready because i'm hungry but i don't really right, care what right. it is exactly. i just want it to <laughs> show up at like six o'clock every night <laughs> is that rude i know, I know. I, uh, oh my god at the height of the pandemic frank and i like you know it was such a big deal when you had to go to the grocery store you know yes. i mean we were stuck in new york too like i couldn't oh, i couldn't get out of here and it was so bad and we'd have to do like every two weeks we'd go to whole foods and like buy you know an unreal amount of food and we'd have the gloves on and the masks yeah and i remember i'm in there with him and he is in the corner trying to decide between like which chicken to buy yeah and he looks at me he's like which one do you want and i snap i was like i don't fucking care like, <laughs> just it's buy chicken. chicken it's chicken yeah. And he's yeah. like, well, I, you know, I care. And I was like, yeah, well, don't ask me then. Like, yeah, exactly. Don't ask me if I, you know, because I don't care because we all know, like, you know, oh, my God. But it I, is again, funny. I, I, I am a foodie. A, yeah. I'm not a foodie. And I, I yeah. sometimes get super confused about the sort of like people are like, oh, that restaurant. Yeah. And, I'm like, and you're like, I don't know. I go, well, it's good to me. I go, that's are good or it's not good. You know, like, right, right, <laughs> right. And that was a lovely taste of that. But now I just yeah. want to have a quesadilla, please. So oh my god, I live for a quesadilla. I know, like if you if you left my own devices, I'm like I would I would truly only eat bread and cheese. Like I'd be like, I, I'm grilled so cheese, yeah, quesadilla, like crackers and cheese, cheese with pizza, a side of wine. Crackers and cheese, exactly. Uh -huh. That's my I mean, favorite meal. Um, it's kind of I mean it covers most of the bases if you throw in a couple really, carrots and some yeah. grapes. Don't we yeah. get the whole food group? <laughs> I'm like, um, isn't that everything? What else do we need? It's totally yeah, true. so anyways, it's going to be a long time till I finish it. Um, I can't wait. I'm, I And I also really wanted to do, after doing such an intense book about my mother, I wanted to do something uh, more related to my father. And so he's like, you know, the ultimate snacker and he makes all, you know, he's a very different relationship to food that I have. So it's, um, it's, it's been fun. It's been fun drawing something totally different. I, I love how much you like your parents. I think that's uncool. <laughs> I know it's so lame of me. I love um, it. I'm like, I'm going to send them. your book to um, my children and be like, see, Good. see how much Hillary loves it. Actually, I think, <laughs> you and, I think you and my daughter have a ton in common too. It's so funny, I'm ready but that to makes hang. sense. Yeah, yeah. She's super cool. Well, yeah. we'll get you guys together sometime in New York, but um, yeah. so fun. So, um, okay, Hillary, so tell everybody where they can find you on Instagram, do you have a website? maybe yeah yeah so i'm you know in, on instagram i'm cartoons by hillary um and kind of just cartoons by hillary everywhere that's just one like l I, yeah one l that's the big news um you know <laughs> 
I'm it was not, always like, one L. I felt like until Hillary. I know, Clinton, but then Hillary then Clinton confused. came in with two, and I'm like, what's with, that, what's with that extra L? What are we? She's doing extra. There? She gets yeah. extra. She's extra. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> poor lady. Um, and you can. Um, I've really pivoted over to Substack these days. I have like a paid newsletter. If you want to read, I post a Fun. lot of comics, so you can find me cartoons by Hillary on Substack. Um, and you know, I'm out there. You know probably just being way too open about my life on the internet <laughs> it's so great I do love it I did think oh my god what how does Hillary's yeah. mom feel about how much she shared oh my god life? she loves it she loves it she's so, it's so proud. cute she's so oh she proud. of course she's yeah. proud I'm proud and yeah. I you know I just met you in a bar yeah <laughs> <laughs> alone in a bar with so your beautiful. dog with, with my doggy with yeah I love that I love that we were at a conference together and Hillary came from New York to Minneapolis with her dog. I know. Well, she had a good time too, you know. Margie she, was like living it up in the Hilton. There's no question that she was the most be- popular girl in the bar. I know. 100%. I know. Every day. 100%. Where's Margie? I know. She's taking a nap, you guys. She's like, she can't do it all. <laughs> That's right. She's kind of an introvert. She needs to recharge. Yeah. Like like me. I was hiding yeah. too. Yeah. Um, well, Hillary, it was so fun. Um, do you know what the new book is called? Snacking? Is that what it's the joy, the joy of snacking. The joy of snacking. I love it. And murder book. So you Yay. guys check these out. And then, yeah, look for Hillary. If you follow her on Instagram, which is where I follow you, mm-hmm. Cartoons by Hillary, um, you get to see all sorts of fun Silly, samples. And then stuff. it sounds like we, yeah. we need to subscribe, Substack, to get our, our Hillary get there. Fix. Yeah, I love it. if you're really, you know, jonesing. <laughs> which Thank we will be. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for joining us. This has been Killer Women with Hillary Fitzgerald Campbell, and we will see you next time. Bye.